Hello and welcome back to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D and I talk about its lore and its history and what it's like to fight in game as well. In this series, rather than just going with my wild, fanciful inclinations of which monsters to draw and talk about and explore the lore of, I like to use your suggestions instead. I like to bundle up every single one of your suggestions, the monsters that you'd like to see me talk about, see my drawing interpretation of, whether they're classic D&D monsters, just something from mythology that hasn't turned up in D&D yet, or something from the annals of time, something that's been in D&D before but hasn't quite reached our current edition. It doesn't matter. I just want to see any of your ideas. So if something strikes you while you're watching this video as a monster that you really like to see me draw, or we'll talk about the lore and history or origin of, then make sure to leave it down in the comment section below, because no matter what, I bundle all of your suggestions together and put them on what I call my to draw list, which is a huge, huge, ever expanding list of monsters, which I hand over to my patrons over on Patreon every single month. And then they vote for which monsters on that list they'd like to see next. And this time they voted to see flail snails, a suggestion originally made by Tamaling. So thank you so much for your suggestion, Tamaling, and thank you to my patrons for picking this monster, because this is an absolutely fantastic one, and one that I've been eager to have a go at drawing, because I actually really like the artwork for this guy. So we'll see if I come up with anything different, or if I just sort of reflavor it slightly. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's get started with today's video. The Flail Snail is another creature who joins us from Volo's Guide to Monsters in 5th edition, but originally joined D&D through 1981's Fiend Folio. This massive mollusk looks like a rampaging monstrosity, but weirdly, despite it having five huge eye stalks with organic spiked maces for ends, this creature is actually a gentle, gross, but gentle giant and despite its appearance, is actually an elemental rather than a monstrosity. It's an earth elemental to be precise. It's unaligned and spends most of its time trying to just travel in a straight line, consuming every bit of earth or rock it can find. It particularly enjoys eating crystals, especially ones that hold some kind of magic. And how does this 10 foot gastropod eat something as tough as earth or crystal, I hear you ask? Well, for a start, as I say, this thing is an earth elemental, so DMs prepare for your players to summon loads and loads of these guys next time they try and conjure an earth elemental using the spell. But these things are used to eating tough stuff on the elemental plane of earth and rock. They've got tiny but powerful jaws, which use their strength 17 to tear through crystal and stone and blend them to shreds, essentially. Real life snails also have these jaws, which are filled with thousands of tiny microscopic teeth, which look like the surface of a cat's tongue, or perhaps Velcro, which are attached to this strange sort of stringy band called a redula. What snails do is that they suck up whatever it is that they want to eat, which is pretty much everything, by the way. Snails aren't picky eaters, even being considered detritivores or detritivores, which means that they're creatures that are happy to eat dead or decaying creatures and their rotting waste, but they're also cool with eating meat or a fresh salad, much the frustration of gardeners absolutely everywhere. But they suck up this food and then they pass it through the redula and do the equivalent of chewing it. They pass it through this redula over and over, which sort of shreds it like a saw or perhaps like a band of sandpaper, and essentially shave it into its component nutrients. When a flail snail does this, it grinds up magical crystals and gems and uses this to produce two things mostly, aside from, you know, sustaining itself. Firstly, it makes a thick, glossy slime, like most gastropods do, and most snails actually produce two different types of slime. It's kind of mucus coating, which it slathers all over its body so it doesn't dry up and desiccate because they're very moisture dependent. And the second kind is that which is produced by their foot. Snails crawl around on one lump of a foot, which really has very little pushing power, which is why, which is one of the reasons that they move so incredibly slowly. In the flail snail's case, only 10 feet per round, so they won't be hunting you down exactly. But the mucus that snail feet produce is weirdly somewhere between a glue and a lubricant, so they can make the incredible efforts of their one foot a little bit easier as they glide along with less friction, 
but also the kind of gluey stickiness of it lets them stick to walls or hang upside down and find food from really, really hard to reach places. The slime that a flail snail produces is so full of finely ground crystals that when it dries, it hardens into almost pure and beautiful glass. It's one of the most sought after materials in your D&D world. It has a kind of mother of pearl like sheen to it and is highly, highly prized. So people often spend their entire lifetimes traveling after or behind flail snails, trying to harvest this snail glass. The second use for this magic crystal dust that flail snails digest is in their shell. Now traditional snail shells are just a place for them to deposit all the calcium that they break down from their food that they eat. It's made of very similar material to like our teeth or our nails, and it builds up into this hard shell which provides them protection from all sorts of damage. And also if they're running low on this mucus, this slime that they use to coat their bodies and they're worried about drying out, they can hide inside of it too to keep moist until it rains a little bit, which is why you always see tons and tons of snails and slugs appearing as soon as it starts to rain, or maybe the day just after when water has settled everywhere. A flail snail's shell is full of the residual magical energy stored in the crystals that they eat. It's a massive, beautiful, glittering anti-magic house. It allows them the use of a rule called anti-magic shell, which states that the snail has advantage on saving throws against spells, and any creature making a spell attack against the snail has disadvantage on the attack roll. If the snail succeeds on its saving throw against the spell, or a spell attack misses it, an additional effect might occur as determined by the rolling of a d6. On a 1 to 2, if the spell affects an area or has multiple targets, it fails and has no effect whatsoever. If the spell targets only the snail, it has no effect on the snail and is reflected back at the caster using the spell slot level, spell save DC, attack bonus and spell casting ability of the original caster. On a 3 to a 4, nothing happens, no additional effects. But on a 5 or a 6, the snail shell converts some of the spell's energy into a burst of destructive force. Each creature within 30 feet of the snail must make a DC 15 constitution saving throw, sorry for spoilers, taking 1d6 force damage per level of the spell on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. So it kind of resonates out, it echoes and chimes like a bell as soon as it's struck with magic. We're also told, and I hope you don't mind me quoting here, that this amazing, beautiful shell is one of the reasons why these snails are hunted and why they need to defend themselves with those massive flails that are their namesake. In a segment called Using the Shell of a Flail Snail, we are told a flail snail shell, which weighs around 250 pounds, has numerous uses. One intact shell can sell for 5,000 gold. Many hunters seek the shell for its anti-magic properties. A skilled armorer can make three shields from one shell. For one month, each shield gives its wielder the snail's anti-magic shell trait that I just read. When the shield's magic fades, it leaves behind an exotic shield that is the perfect item for which to make a spell guard shield. A flail snail can also be used to make a robe of scintillating colors. The shell is ground and added to the dye while the, while the garments are being fashioned. The powder is also a material component of the ritual that enchants the robe. So like I say, not only does it have an entourage of people following it to collect its beautiful and valuable glassy slime, but also people might try and kill these things, again I'm looking at you adventurers, so that they can harvest its shell for all sorts of wonderful magical items, or just simply to sell for that massive 5,000 gold. So it has a means of defending itself with these massive eye stalks that look like huge maces. It starts off with five of these tentacle maces, although obviously you can try and cut those off, and it has a multi-attack which strikes with every single one of them, each of which dealing 1d6 plus 3 bludgeoning damage. But again, times that by 5 and you're dealing some fairly serious damage for a challenge rating 3 creature. Alternatively, it can defend itself using its shell defense, where it withdraws into its shell, gaining a plus 4 to its AC, which is already at 16 until it chooses to emerge, which can be as a bonus action on its own turn. As perhaps a warning signal to stay away from it, it can use an ability called Scintillating Shell, but it can only use this once, and it recharges after a short or a long rest. We're told that the sh snail's shell emits dazzling, coloured light until the end of the snail's next turn. During this time, the shell sheds brilliant light in a 30-foot radius, and dim light for an additional 30 feet. 
and creatures that can see the snail have a disadvantage on attack rolls against it. In addition, any creature within the bright light who are able to see the snail when this power is activated must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or be stunned until the light ends. So it's a good warning to kind of get rid of people who it fears are going to be harvesting it before this unaligned creature starts smashing people into pulp with its flail eyes. Now, if none of your players are deterred by this experience, if they've sufficiently asked the spellcaster not to throw anything hideous at this creature so that its shell doesn't reflect all of the damage or cause these echoing shockwaves of magical energy, and they're just going to let the fighters get in there and smash this creature up so they can harvest this poor living creature's shell and slime. The flail snail has one final trick up its sleeve, its gooey gooey sleeve. And that is the most potent guilt trip you might experience in D&D for a good long time. In a rule called Flail Tentacles, we learn exactly how upsetting killing a flail snail can be. We're told that the flail snail has five tentacles. Whenever the snail takes ten damage or more in a single turn, one of its tentacles dies, a bit like a hydra. If even one tentacle remains, the snail regrows all the dead ones within 1d4 days. Not so bad, right? But if all the tentacles die, the snail retracts into its shell, gaining total cover, as per the shell defense rule, and it begins wailing, a sound that can be heard for 600 feet, stopping only when it dies 5d6 minutes later. So it cries like a dying infant if you deal too much damage to this thing, so that you know how much of a monster you are for trying to make profit off of killing something that is doing no harm to you. And you can repent, because we're told that healing magic that restores limbs, such as a regenerate spell, can halt this dying process. So I think this is a great creature to throw at murder hobo parties to make them think about their behaviour. Because if that's not why this creature was created, I honestly don't know why. It's basically just a walking money sack that cries until it dies if you hurt it too much. Because you're a monster. But anyway, I really loved talking about the flail snail today, and I really enjoyed drawing it as well. I hope you did too. I hope you enjoyed watching this video as well. If you did, make sure to leave a little like, a little thumbs up down below. Maybe favourite this video and share it with the rest of your D&D party in case they need to curb their behaviour before the DM throws something like a flail snail at them for their avarice, greed, and disregard for living creatures. Whenever you share and like and all this kind of stuff, it shows YouTube whether or not I'm doing a good job. So I really appreciate if you do that. Hopefully it means that we can get seen by a few more people. And if you want to subscribe as well, I make a video at least once a week, but sometimes I do a second one as well on Fridays, if my schedule allows, so I hope you'll subscribe as well. I recently learned that only half of my viewers are subscribed to the channel, so if you do have an account or want to make one, want to hit the subscribe button, it really, really helps, so thank you very much for doing that. Otherwise, I hope you'll think twice before you slash up any beautiful but valuable creatures to harvest for parts, and try and stick to those creatures which are causing direct harm and confrontation to others the good aligned people I know you all are. So until next time, happy monster hunting.